going. Uh, all right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening uh, for our first seminar of the year, the uh, whatever you want to call it, officer seminar, flash fire officer seminar. I'm proud to be joined by George Latanzi, Mike Dowling, uh, and we'll get, we'll get into them in a, a couple minutes. I'm just going to give a few uh, a few quick plugs, if you don't mind. So I'll, first of all, I'm going to share my screen. You guys shall be able to see this. Um, so this is uh, the first part of our seminar series for the year. Uh, they're all going to be free. They're all going to be online. They're all going to be at the same time, uh, 7.15. You can see the dates up here. Uh, we're going to do uh, meters in a couple of weeks, the 25th. Thermal imaging, uh, these aren't in order. As you can see, thermal imaging on March 8th. So if we go in order, February 7th, we're gonna do cr uh, crush syndrome. What's the real story? Kyle does that. Uh, it's a new class that he just did. And it really came from at the EMS uh, EMS seminar, just talking and, and saying, hey, how, how concerned do we really have to do with this? And it got some good discussion going. And so we've decided to uh, kind of make it into a class based on that. Um, then we have, uh, on February 20, uh, 15th, we're going to be doing Getting on the Job 101. That's going to be with John Plofkin and Chris Zach from Milford, John Plofkin from Wilton. And they're going to, you know, kind of give you some, I, I think it's going to kind of do a little bit uh, spin off of tonight as well. Uh, not just getting on the job, but also getting promoted on the job, if you will. Um, so I hope that that will be, uh, you know, something that would, that'll be well received and attended as well. And then uh, come... Uh, I'll shut that off in a minute. February 28th, we're going to do a uh, kind of an introduction to Elkhart Safe Fleet product line. That's something that we've uh, <clears throat> taken on as part of strategic safety. So that'll be a fun evening. And then we will get into uh, thermal imaging cameras in March. And that is uh, hopefully going to, I'm going to be joined by Joel Margo, who uh, used to work for Avon Argus, has a lot of experience in the uh, thermal imaging industry. So that should be exciting. Um, let me go. So the other thing we're working on, the South Windsor Rescue Weekend, uh, it's going uh, extremely well. The registration is through the roof, so there's really not a ton of options left. Um, but where we're, hold on, Zachary, you have to go in the other room. Uh, but where we're looking on here is uh, we have the Friday Lecture Series. We still have some room available there. And then um, we move in uh, the other class we have available is Saturday evening. There's still availability. Introduction to Shoring, which is a new class we're going to be rolling out there, is on Sunday. We still have some spots there. The Saturday version is full. And then Flashover, we're going to we still have some spots available uh, as well on Sunday. So there is some still some availability still there if you guys are interested. And then at the end of the night, I will uh, send out a uh, evaluation so you guys can rate how tonight goes as well. Um, so that's kind of the big stuff there. We're very excited to roll out 2022. Uh, you know, hopefully it'll be uh, just as good as, uh, if not better than uh, the last couple of years we've been doing. So the, um, the way tonight's going to go is uh, I'm going to run through some of the questions and whatnot. And uh, I, I kind of put together like half a dozen or so questions that, uh, you know, I thought would be good. And then based on everybody that uh, signed up, there were probably 25 or so questions that were asked or topics that were brought up. And so obviously we can't go through all 25. So I kind of condensed, I kind of condensed them into about six or so. So before I get into introductions and I'll let the panelists introduce themselves, um, I think we need to give a congratulations to Mike Dowling who is getting promoted to captain tomorrow. Uh, so he will actually be outranking George and I. Uh, but he had his last interview last night and uh, very proud of him. Uh, so that, that ceremony will be tomorrow and uh, glad to have you with us. So without, without further ado, I will start with you, Mike. So why don't you introduce yourself um, about you, your department, your fire service background and anything else, you know, maybe that you're looking forward to tonight and whatnot. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm Mike. Uh, I work for the Hamden Fire Department. Um, in my 15th year, uh, six of those years were as a company officer, um, as a lieutenant. Uh, as Dan said, I, I just uh, was lucky enough to get promoted last night. Um, we're a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I have a bachelor's degree from UNH. Um, I volunteered briefly in Hamden. Uh, we're technically a combination town, but uh, there's as I'm sure anybody else that volunteers in here, uh, volunteerism is down. 
you know, so in, in, in town, uh, we don't really have any active volunteers anymore. So we're technically a combination department, but we don't really operate that way. Um, we're about a hundred members when we're fully staffed, five engines. Uh, of the five engines, we have a Quint and a squad, tower ladder, time chief, two paramedic rescue trucks. Um, just trying to think of what else. Uh, we do about 10,000 runs a year. A lot of EMS. This year was a busy fire year, but uh, I didn't get to go to any of those, seems like. So um, that's pretty much about me for right now. For, that's to get, good to get us started. So to get going, yeah. Mike, Mike, I just met probably a year or so ago through Cal. Uh, George, unfortunately, I've known for a lot longer than that. I probably met him, uh, I think, through the Fairfield Fire School when we were teaching there. Um, so, George, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your history? Yeah, I would say I met you probably uh, in Trumbull, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, I just want to uh, just say I idolized Dan Gordon. So if anybody could see that, he's the man. All right. And there'll be more pictures to come. Don't worry. Don't worry. I got mine, too, because people <laughs> threatened me before. So. Uh, 46 years old. I've, I got hired in Greenwich in 2000. I've been on for 22 years now. Um, uh, volunteered since 1993 at uh, the age of 18. Um, I got a separated town of Monroe. Um, has about 23 square miles, about 800 calls a year. So I volunteer basically from firefighter all the way up to chief of the department, uh, where I did that for about seven years. Uh, basic town, which is, you know, residential, a little commercial, nothing crazy. Um, the good thing about that department that I love to see throughout the years is there's so many people that got on the job, um, which is really good. Uh, if I fast forward to Greenwich again, got hired in 2000. There was 12 of us, actually 13 of us in total that got hired the, on that class. Um, we recently uh, have our new assistant chief in Greenwich that came from Hamden, and uh, he was on the, uh, in the academy with us as well. So Greenwich is an interesting place. Uh, it's about 50 square miles. Uh, cover coastline 95, the parkway, uh, route one. Um, and again, interesting in the building construction, two and a half, three woods, capes, ranches, et cetera, all the way up to three, four story ordinaries, uh, hospital. And then what's really interesting is you start getting in the back country, there's like 20, 30,000 square foot homes with no hydrants. Uh, so that's, the town is kind of split in half north and south that way. So it, it's very interesting. A combination department, there's eight stations in total, uh, six career engines, a truck company, uh, deputy chief as a shift commander. Uh, two of the stations, one of them is full volunteer. The other one is actually in New York, Banksville, New York, um, which we consider our station seven. And then there's volunteers throughout the town. Um, each, each apparatus for career has three on it, driver, officer, firefighter. Uh, we have a marshal's office, several chiefs and admin, uh, training chief, et cetera. Um, I was promoted in 2019 and currently assigned to Engine 1, which is downtown. We run no medical, really, um, and we're pretty busy. We're over 2,000 calls a year for that engine, um, and I would say that's about it for now. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so those that don't know, uh, my name's Dan Gordon. I grew up in Trumbull, started in Trumbull Center when I was 15, probably would have started at 10 if they let me, um, you know, volunteered there throughout. Uh, high school and college on and off when I was not at college. I uh, got hired in New York City at 21. Um, I was a training officer in Trumbull Center for many years. And uh, then when my wife and I moved up to uh, Monroe, became a, a member there and a training officer there. Now I've been an officer for uh, three years in New York. Um, and I've just always been drawn to the training aspect of things. Obviously, that's what Flash Fire is based off of. And seeing where there where gaps were, and when flash fire when I started flash fire, the gap to me was just not having anywhere to do the training. Um, but you know, unless you wanted to travel 20, 30 minutes to the fire school, um, and then you would end up you know doing basics there when you could have done the basics at your firehouse and then gone to the fire school and done the more advanced stuff. So the other thing that I'm seeing a lot now is is uh, training of officers, and uh, you know, there's a lot of talk and you know I'm on a, a, I talk to a lot of guys that you know are either have frustrations or aren't sure where to go with being an officer or how to how to t 
take on the role. And so that's kind of where this comes up. I, I don't think this isn't like a shoring class or a forcible entry class where you can teach A, B, and C, and this is how you do it. I think when it comes to leadership, um, you know, the more you take in, the better you're going to be. I don't expect anyone to take everything George says, everything Mike says, or everything I say tonight and take it as gospel. You got to take a little bit of everything. Everything tonight we say is our opinion. I don't think there's a ton of, you know, point to a book that this is how you have to do it. But I think that that's what makes the fire service great. Um, you know, there's 50, so there's 55 people here. I know for a fact that there are a few departments where multiple people are logged in. So there's at least, I'll say 75 people here tonight on their own time that want to better themselves or want to get a different perspective on things. And so when people say the fire service is dying, yeah, you could look at TikTok and definitely come to that conclusion. I do pretty much every day, but there's a lot of good out there too. So I'm hoping to bring that out tonight as well. Um, so thank you guys for joining us and I uh, look forward to getting to it. So we'll start with, um, again, I have a few stop questions that I put together. Uh, being a firefighter, what did you think of your officers? And more importantly, were there any qualities that you wanted to make sure you latched on to the future or ones that you wanted to make sure that you didn't carry with you when you got promoted? So George, you want to start us off with something like that? You know what I'll actually do is uh, I'll, if you have your chat window open, I'll put that in the chat window so you can kind of reference it um, as you answer. Okay. Uh for our department, what was interesting uh, when we got hired, there actually weren't many officers. The department was transitioning from uh, pretty heavier on the volunteer side with paid drivers. And then uh, years before us, the guys were building up, you know, as firefighters on the rigs. But there were so many apparatus that had no officers. I believe there was a shift lieutenant and then a lieutenant up in the North Country, and that's it. Um, so they had a tough time, you know, because they transitioned from uh, a department that was one way and trying to transition down from there. Um, I would say some of the officers as I, as time has gone on, because again, we've got to see officers go to every piece of apparatus now, which is great. Um, I would honestly have to say that there were several of them that didn't complain at all. They were go-getters um, as time went on. Uh, you can tell, especially when they were firefighters and moving their way up to lieutenant, uh, they just had that way about them. You wanted to work with them. Uh, some of them have since retired. Uh, some of them are still there. Um, there was one in particular that I really looked up to in our, in the career department. Uh, he was a deputy chief. He went from firefighter lieutenant, deputy chief, uh, and then he moved on. Uh, but really good dude. And, and same now. I mean, there's a lot of good guys. But um, negative way, you know, unfortunately, I, I don't care where you are. There's people that, you know, are, are very into it and that are, aren't. So, you know, some people, there's a lack of investment and sometimes that shows. And unfortunately, is the investment have to do with what's going on in their life that you just don't know? You know, so it's hard to really judge sometimes. Um, but at that point, just kind of lean towards the positive side of things and go from there. Um, real quick on the volunteer side, uh, there were many mentors. I, at the time I got in, there were a lot of good people there. And a lot of them were on the job and a lot and several of them weren't. And they just kind of built up things. And, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. So. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll skip Mike. I'll go next and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Mike last. Uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, things that I looked up to, uh, certainly, and this is probably something that will come up later, but in terms of getting involved in the house functions versus the you know, fire ground functions. I think uh, some of the best officers I worked at knew when they had good senior men that could kind of take care of the day-to-day -day business. And I know senior man is generally referred to more on the career side, but I don't care. I think it has just as much play in the volunteer fire service as well. Uh, but also knowing when they need to get involved. I had a lot of good officers that were very good on the fire ground, but sometimes, you know, got involved too much on the day-to-day -day operations. Like, oh, you have to do this first or that, and it didn't really matter. Um, but giving the senior men, you know, kind of the ability to run the house on the day-to-day -day operations, I think was something that I definitely, uh, you know, looked up to, uh, being able to kind of take a step back and let them do it. 
in terms of the fire ground, just again, knowing what your guys are capable of being able to say, I don't have to micromanage that guy, or maybe I do have to micro. I mean, again, we're going to talk about it later. There are certainly firemen that, you know, aren't here to be firemen. And so how do you manage that? Um, I think is a, is a challenge. And that's something that many people brought up. So I know that we will talk about that as well. Um, so a lot of that stuff, just being able to take a step back when you needed to let the senior men take care of it. Again, career volunteer, I don't care, there's senior men on both sides. Uh, that was definitely something that I wanted to emulate. And just being able to use those senior guys to, you know, what they're for. A lot of them have more time than the officer, which again is something people brought up that we're going to talk about later. Um, being able to use them to either on calls or at drills and things like that. Uh, so that's definitely some of the stuff I look to. So Mike. Uh, yeah, pretty much, uh, can echo those sentiments there. Um, I, I'm a proponent as we'll get to later of the using the senior man. Um, but coming up in, uh, our fire department, we, there were like good officers, bad officers. Um, I, some negative traits that I, I don't like, and I try to stay away from is I, I hated being micromanaged. I hated having someone right there over your shoulder, like kind of questioning what you're doing while you're doing it. It's like, I know what I'm supposed to do. Just let me work a little bit. So I try to be as hands off as possible. And I think that's um, a good place to get to, to where you're utilizing your people the way they should be. And you're just kind of there observing, um, you know, good qualities that I, I, I've had several bosses I work for who are very calm. You almost, almost too calm to where, you don't realize that there's an emergency going on because they're just so monotone throughout the entirety of the call, um, which which is good because it, it breeds more calmness. So if some if the first company gets there and they start screaming, it's you know it amps everybody else up. You know, people start driving a little faster. You know you start making bad decisions. Um, you start making quicker decisions than you really need to be. Um, I think that first arriving officer is very important to be calm, uh, give a good, concise size up and get to work. Um, we had a major retirement. We lost like 15 guys that were over 20 years, 20 year guys. Um, a lot of institutional knowledge left just walked out the door in November, you know, so there's uh there's going to be a delay, you know, before we start promoting people. And we, the good news is we have a lot of good up and comers that are coming uh, up and through the, through the ranks. So it'd be interested to see where the next, you know, the short term and the long term of our job goes. Um, but yeah, being, I think that's uh, cool. kind of what I have to say about that, but yeah, we'll hit on some of that. I think that can expand a lot more. Uh, Without a doubt. Yeah. So the, uh, I just uh, real quick, uh, what was your promotional process? And I'll start, uh, because that's something I always get asked. I probably get a couple of texts a month saying, Hey, I'm going for uh, you know, Lieutenant's test or captain's test. What recommendation do you have? Uh, you know, how should I do in the oral things like that? So let me just put it out there. Anyone that's going for an oral interview, I am the last person you want to talk to. I have never sat for an oral interview in my life. I am civil service through and through. So I can read a book, study, and apparently do well enough. But in terms of what they ask at an oral interview, that's not my thing. So there's some guys, and, and that's going to be a lot of what we talk about on uh, the, uh, you know, getting on the job 101, both from the entry level, and I'm sure we'll hit on some promotional uh, orals as well. But, um, you know, mine's, mine was just reading books and, uh, and taking the test. Uh, there's seniority as well. But it, it was just a written exam, so I don't have a lot of advice on, on that aspect of it. Um, and that's both for getting on the job, lieutenant, and captain's test. So, uh, George and Mike, do you want to just kind of hit on quickly uh, on your uh, promotional experiences? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so ours, when I took the test for lieutenant, um, it was 100% written. And then you added seniority points uh, from there. And uh, since our CBA changed, we have a 75% written and a 25% oral. Um, so you got to pass each one of those individually. They calculate your score and then they'll add your seniority points based on the CBA. Um, and then there's one little extra step is, you know, it's civil service. So once they certify that list, it goes to civil service for uh, approval. We have uh, fire commissioners 
uh, in town. So the police has a commission, we have a commission and we sit before them for the final interview. So we use the rule of three. So if there's one, one opening, you bring in three, three members for that one opening. And the idea is that everyone's equal that night. And it's kind of whoever has the best interview in front of this panel of commissioners uh, is how it goes. So that's the one little extra than, than your thing there. But uh, yeah, this was my first oral interview. Um, it was, it went okay. I obviously guess. good enough. <laughs> yeah, obviously good enough, yeah. So, uh, George, what about you for uh, Greenwich? Mike, was there role playing in that too or no? Uh, no, we didn't have an assessment center. We, uh, there was talk about it. Um, I think it will be coming, I think with the, depends on the, you know, I think Charlie was a big um, proponent for assessment center, but that didn't trickle down through the, uh, the local. So okay. I, I'm sure it's coming. I mean, it seems to be being used very widely uh, from many other people I talked to, at least at, especially at the battalion chief level, uh, yeah. really immersing them in like a scenario, like a chaotic scenario. And how do you, I think it's a pretty good test, right? You know, cause you can, you can take a test, you can read a book, you can answer the questions, you can answer some questions in an oral, but you're not getting a really accurate picture of how is this person going to act when they, when they have to. I can't read a book, so. There you go. <laughs> um, this is sponsored by 44-1, Chris Kerr of Rockland County. Um, so Greenwich, uh, for as long as I've known, the written 70%, the oral interview is 30%. Throughout the years, it's changed in the sense of uh, the reading material. It was all over the place for a while. It seems pretty consistent now. Um, I want to say there's usually four or five books. Um, they give you a decent amount of time. I think the last one for the guys wasn't the, the time between the written and the interview. There wasn't much time. It was like three days or four days. Um, it took me several tries again, and maybe on the same thing as Dan is like, I'm not good at that side. I, I just never been. Um, I've got a lot of tutoring from guys that were on the job uh, that are currently on the job going out outside of the job and look for help. Um, I feel confident in my skills, but regarding the written it's always been tough for me. You know, I've scored in the 80s and I feel good about that. But in our department, you got to get in the 90s or high, you know, high 90s sometimes. Um, and again, on the contract now, it's every two years for the lieutenants. And just like you in Hamden, um, I think we're a little different in the sense that we're losing people on like a consistent basis. So it's not like mass exodus, but from our admin, you know, to our deputies, to lieutenants, firefighters, we are just going through uh, people like crazy. And it's good because guys are retiring and, you know, they put their time in, but it, the job is changing. Um, again, the reading list was back and forth, but now it's pretty much the same company officer, um, safety officer, that type of stuff. Um, the testing company, they've used at the same time. And then for the deputies, it's actually different, uh, the written, and then they also do uh, an assessment center from there. So um, that's the basics. And I know, so I know just uh, from the volunteer side, Monroe, how do they, how does Monroe do their officers? So they do a, uh, um, First off, you have to have prerequisites in order to apply, and then you have to do an application. Uh, in my time as chief, there was no application, but they started that shortly after. It's not a bad move. Uh, the people that are there now as officers, they reapply and the new ones. Um, and then the prerequisites, um, you know, you have to have, it's not that bad. And then from there, you know, it's a whole interview process and it, it doesn't mean you're in, you know, there's, there's people that haven't gotten it, so. When I was in Trumbull, it was the chief got elected and he appointed his entire staff from there. Yeah. Stephanie, last I knew, was a chief and the deputy and assistants were elected and then they appointed below there. So, you know, and there's a mix and there are some departments where everyone's elected, some everyone, you know, so everyone's appointed. So it's definitely a mix out there. And I'm sure we will talk about how to kind of navigate all that. Um, I got, I got to tell you, Dan, from the volunteer yeah. side, I was not a fan of um a vote for all officers i don't i don't like that i don't even i think when, i think when you vote for all officers you're not you're kind of handcuffing the chief because if yep. he gets one or two guys that he doesn't want to work with or doesn't think that they're valid um or whatever the case may be it just it, it kind of hamstrings him handcuffs him to not be able to carry out some of the policies that he may want want to carry out so i agree 
Uh, that was, yeah. Uh, uh, George, do you guys have uh, any specific requirements in, in Greenwich there? Uh, for us, it's just time and grade. Yeah, five years on the job. And then uh, once you're promoted, there's a certain amount of time that you have that you got to get instructor and officer one. Um, okay, yeah, we don't have, there's still, there's zero. It's just time and grade at each each step. Okay. Yeah, we're okay. three three years as firemen before you can take the lieutenant's test, but then one day in rank in order to take the tests above. So, for example, that they gave the captain, you know, they put out the captain's exam uh, a year and a half ago now, it got delayed through COVID. And then as guys got promoted, they would open it up for a week for the guys that have gotten promoted in the meantime. So you could you could get promoted on a Monday and take the captain's test the following Saturday. Uh, so it's just interesting. And you also need some credits, uh, 60 credits for lieutenant, 80 for captain and a bachelor's degree for a battalion chief as of now. So if I could just real quick studying yeah. wise, a lot of the newer guys uh, and my deputy chief actually is very good at it, like group studying. You know, I was someone that just really didn't do that. And they find a lot when they group study, you know, they get to just go back and forth with information and build off each other. And it seems to work, you know, so just when I was studying, when I was studying for lieutenant, there were probably a dozen guys in my house studying and it definitely helped out. You get the daily work chores done. And then in the afternoon, instead of everyone going their separate ways, there'd be, you know, five or six guys getting together and studying and it definitely made cool. a difference. So. All right. So that's kind of the promotional process. Um, once you got promoted, what happens for you guys? Uh, you know, do you get a new crew, new shift? How were you treated as a new officer? Do you feel like there were things that could have better prepared you for that transition from firefighter to officer? Start with Mike, because I'm throwing you last. Or, um, so I'll, I'll, put, I'll put that on the chat so you can see it as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so ge generally it seems that uh, when you get that first promotion, um, you don't stick around with your same crew just to, uh, you know, kind of mix it up a little bit, get out of your comfort zone. Gen generally, you don't stay at the same house that you're at either. They'll move you um, somewhere else. Uh, right, right now, there's so many vacancies, like it's uh, any, anything can happen, you know, kind of a deal. Um, I did not get, I did not stay with my uh, same crew. I got moved from uh, th threes. I was on the tower and I got moved down to engine two. And then I, I did several years down there. Um, I'm just looking at your notes there. Um, yeah, so I, I was I was like an, an eight year junior guy. We had a very senior crew as a private and, uh, and I got promoted. I was the boss and the senior guy at that time. So I went from kind of a know-it-all sitting riding backwards, uh, being completely insulated by senior guys and good officers and then you get promoted and you get to a new crew and everyone's looking at you, right? So it's like, now you have to be the boss kind of a deal. Um, probably prepared better. Um, I, I, I think you, you can't over prepare, but you can overthink. Um, so it's just kind of, you got to just do it. I think you got to just get out there and get, get the runs make some decisions. Um, it's, it's kind of easier, I think for us a little bit, uh, cause when you work on the rescue truck with the uh, paramedic, you know, you are, you're talking on the radio, you're making decisions, you're operating by yourself, um, at fires, the rescue truck, um, you know, it, it's up to the engine officer they're housed with, um, whether they are, I use them as search and rescue as a two man search search team. Uh, some guys will pair them up and make a five man engine. It, it all depends for me. It was situational. Like if it was going to be a difficult stretch, then we'll use them for the stretch and then they'll break off and do their search. Um, if, if it's like a pretty standard stretch, then they're just going to go take the door VES, uh, search, whatever, uh, we have them to do there. Uh, so that as a private on the rescue, you do make more decisions for yourself uh, than an, 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 an officer at a slower engine house. That's, um, That's definitely an interesting perspective on it that I could relate to. I mean, when you're working in a truck, uh, you know, a lot of the times you're by yourself, whether you're the OV or the roof man or the chauffeur, you're kind of by yourself making decisions. So I think that's an interesting perspective on it. Um, and I, I think for me, one of the things that that can help out too 
is, you know, and this is something that actually the volunteer aspect has advantages over is riding that front seat before you become promoted. And, uh, you know, I, on the career side, it's easy to say, hey, you're on the list. Uh, why don't you ride up front today? And the volunteer side, a lot of times, just because you're not an officer doesn't mean you're not riding that front seat if, you know, you're the uh, senior firefighter that shows up. And so I think um, that that kind of plays into also just you got to be ready for anything, you know, especially I, I've always said that being a chief officer in a volunteer fire department is probably harder in the first five to 10 minutes of a fire than a career department. If our chief doesn't show up at an incident in New York, the first five, 10 minutes, nothing is going to change. Everyone knows where they have to go. We all know how we're staffed. There's very few uh, variables to play in that first five, 10 minutes. When you talk about a volunteer department where you could get three guys in the afternoon or you could get 25 guys at night, there's a lot more that the chief has to consider of how he's going to delegate his crew and where he's going to put them to work. And as much as we want to sit here and say we would stretch a line and do a search, there's many times where you have to choose which one are you going to do? Because if you try to do both, you're going to do a really bad job at both of them. So yeah. I think that that's a, a fairly good point. I mean, to completely cut you off. So if you had anything uh, to uh, uh, no, No, I think that was it. Um, just looking at my notes. Yeah, no, I didn't. I think that. Uh, what about you, George? What, what are your thoughts on uh, as a new officer, what you were prepared for, what you weren't prepared for, things like that? Well, it's funny, real quick on the volunteer side, you mentioned it. One thing that worked here that they took from Trumbull, which is south of Monroe, is the staffing levels. So in a lot of volunteer houses, they'll just sign on the air, um, you know, engine, whatever is just responding. And as a commander on scene or as another officer coming in, what do they have for staffing? You know, is it a driver? Is it two, three, et cetera? Um, so you actually sign on with the rig. Um, we'll say three and one. So three is interior and one is exterior. And it seems to work because now you could formulate a plan on that staffing coming in. Um, in Greenwich, they, the same thing. They try to, to get you off of a, the shift that you're on. So they try to, to transfer you to a different shift and then also a, a different station if they can. But like we said, bless you. Like we said, at that point, so many people are retiring, it's out of control. So you can't necessarily do that. Um, it seems to be working okay. A lot of officers that are getting promoted really are into the job and and um, that doesn't seem to be an issue. The ones that have been on the same group. Uh, for me, I got transferred off um, within a year and a half period. I wanna say I went from uh, three different groups. Uh, the group now, I went to station five, a slower engine. Um, the guy driving 20 plus years, about 20 years on, and then the backseat guy, I want to say about a year on, you know, good guys, right? Um, but different, different levels, uh, of life, different levels of firefighting, et cetera. And then just time, right? As more time goes on, we tend to, you know, not be as much into it. And we need sometimes the younger guys to push us. And I, I could tell you that right now in my position, a lot of the young guys, you know, they help me along. I'm not saying the older guys don't, but the younger guys are energetic. Um, so that was good in that sense where, you know, the senior guy and then the junior guy and then myself, we would just talk about stuff and, you know, it's kind of just working as a team. Um, I was down there for a little bit and then transferred to headquarters where I've been since. And that engine headquarters has got a deputy, a truck and the engine. And I can't ask for more on that engine. And I'm not saying negatively about the truck or the deputy. They're great guys, but we just flow so well together. Um, and it, it's enjoyable. It really is. Um, for being prepared, honestly, um, in our department, because again, we're in that growing phase. Um, there really was not a ton of officer training. And like you and I have talked about, and Mike and I recently on text, like it's just not there. And it's hard because you have to learn as time goes on or learn from, you know, different classes and whatnot. But I got to say like kudos to the chiefs. Now they're really trying. So they developed a whole program uh, for the acting lieutenants. Cause once you're, once you take that test, you're on a list and then 16 of you act, um, you know, and, and they're really just starting to lay the foundation, which is great because that wasn't there before. Yeah, no, it's uh 
So the way we do, we do get, we don't just get a whole new shift per se, but we go to, um, we'll get transferred out of usually the borough that we're in. So listen, it's definitely a, a whole different ball game. I'm not pretending that it's not, but what I'll say is your, your reputation precedes you. And so both good and bad. So don't think that just because, you know, we have a whatever 12,000 person department, if you did something bad when you were a fireman, it will, it will follow you, you know, uh, what does 1075 mean? Yeah, exactly. So, and that's what, uh, and that's not a, uh, you know, it is what it is. You can always make your, you can always come in and, and give yourself a fresh reputation, if you will, but your, what you've done will follow you where you worked, you know, it does follow you. Um, and just like it would in any, you know, Oh, he was on B shift or something like that. You'll hear that all the time. So, you know, I just think that even if you're a fireman now, if, if you have aspirations of, of future as an officer, just remember that what you do now will reflect on you both good and bad. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're not going to make mistakes because I make mistakes all the time, but it's how you, it's how you face those mistakes and how you come back from them, which I think is the big, you know, that's, that's what, that's what makes a leader a leader is how they, how they deal with the mistakes that they make, because that's the other thing when I was, um, you know, in, in the volunteer fire service, there, there were just too many, I ran into too many people that never made mistakes. You know, they would never admit to doing something wrong. It was always somebody else's fault. And if you can admit that you make a mistake, then I don't trust you because everybody makes mistakes and they could be small, they could be large. But if you're going to go through life saying that you're perfect and you don't make a mistake, then probably, you know, I think we all know what the what the outcome of that eventually will be. Um, so I, I think that that's something to keep in mind. Uh, what I want to get into now is what what we're all here for: fires and emergencies. So, yeah, yeah what, real quick, yeah, I, I don't please, think you could. Have, I don't think you could have uh, said it any better. You know that that's that, that's dead on. So fires and emergencies, what do you feel are some tips that you can pass along for new officers that had to operate at fires and emergencies? And for you, self-reflection, where are your personal strengths and weaknesses when it comes to fires and emergencies? So I don't know, George, you want to start? Sure. Um, I would say the biggest thing, and this goes from the probie all the way to the most senior person in the firehouse, is be prepared. Be as prepared as you can. And by saying that, um, you know, I watched uh, the gentleman from Harrisburg the other night. I forget his name, but he's a battalion chief, I believe. Um, and he said it well. It's like all those basic fundamentals, you better, you better have it down, like putting your gear on, getting out in the rig, you know, knowing your equipment, et cetera, all the way to advancing line ladders, et cetera. We have to have that down. And as a, as a firefighter, um, Mike, I think you might've said it in a sense of sitting in the back, you're in your cocoon, right? But as the officer, not only do you have to worry about what you're doing, but what your crew is doing, and then you have to worry about much more at that point. Um, so I believe that if you as an officer really focus on, and again, I'm, I'm just a couple of years in on this in the career end, um, you know, with some volunteer experience as well as an officer, if you just take that time and really focus on that stuff and especially work with your crew, um, I think that things will evolve from there. Um, another one is, and I find myself doing this, like sometimes you got to make a decision, right? So even on a basic call, if you just go to power line down or, or, an, or an MVA, you know, sometimes you find yourself just overthinking when the, the easy answer is right there. So just make a decision, a decision, be, dead on with it. Try not to waver if you can help it unless safety, you know, gets in the way um, and stick with it. Um, another one, if I may, is that there's no doubt when you pull up on certain incidences, everybody's nervous. And I don't care, again, if you're the new guy or the old guy. And at that point, can you take that nervousness and basically hide it away and do the job? Years ago in town here as a volley, we had a very bad accident where a kid burned to death and he was trapped and it's tough. It's tough and it affects everybody, but you kind of got to take that deep breath and focus and then step forward from there. So, 
you know, there's obviously so many things that are out there, but I think those are some of the main ones. If you could just focus on, um, it's a good step in the right direction. Um, you never know who you're helping that ended up being a firefighter, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, worst one ever I could ever imagine. Um, so just very quick, I know a little long winded, uh, weaknesses. It's funny because, uh, my very good friend, uh, car two of Greenwich is texting me that I don't do my reports. (laughs) That's definitely a weakness. So, uh, I definitely got to hammer down on some reports. Um, another one that's big on me is that in Greenwich, we're going to these homes again, they're, they're massive homes. So you go into these utility rooms because you have to deal with an odor or something, an issue with something. You're not looking at a 200 amp panel or you're not looking at, you know, a minor sump pump. You're talking, you know, massive, massive rooms. And, and to connect the dots, it, it's, it's tough. So especially those guys or girls with the trades, you know, they know that stuff. For me, that, that's, a, that's a very big weakness and I'm trying to work on. So there's many more I've listed, but I've long winded enough. So weaknesses, I assume, right? Yeah. Mike, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So you kind of, you kind of hit it on there earlier. Uh, my, my tip always to like new people is, um, is your reputation, right? It, it starts when you get on, because if you're not, if you're kind of a slug, when you get on, it's, you're not going to miraculously be better because you got promoted. Um, you know, and that's, is, is also be, be authentic, you know, be yourself. Don't try to be somebody that you're not, you know, if you don't know something, you don't know it and don't act like you do because it's going to be very obvious very soon to people who do know that you don't know. Um, Trying to think what else, uh, yeah, to echo what George said, uh, be decisive, right? If you're, if you're the boss, be, be the boss, be, be there, have a command presence uh, because you know, once companies start showing up, if you're not making decisions, that's when people start freelancing, people start making their own decisions. Um, you know, it, you get, you'll get walked on, you'll get walked right over. Um, and that's, that's bad for business because you have, you, you, then you have no control. You have no control of what your plan is, is, was this, you didn't tell anybody you were kind of weak minded in it. And somebody just steamrolled you and did something else that you are now responsible for. And you didn't want to happen. Um, you know, so I think that's, that comes into play. I think one of the questions was how do you, as like a younger person or a younger officer, a younger time on the job, deal with um, more senior members, right? And I think the answer is you're, you're the boss, right? And you have to, I would seek that, those people out. I personally, I, that's, I believe in the senior man or senior person concept. You have to seek them out and, you know, kind of say, hey, listen, I know I'm new at this. You've been here longer. I'm going to lean on you a lot you know, to help me make the right decisions. And this can either be a good partnership or it can just not work out. Yeah. I don't uh, know. I, think, the, I don't know if the person wrote deal with them, but I would say you're not dealing with them. You're using them just like. You said. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I think too, like if you see, if you're, if your guys are doing something that you don't want them to do, you have to stop them. You have to say, no, that's not what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll have a discussion as to why I, did, I didn't want to do that later. If that, if that if it's something that has to get done, you need to stop the action that you don't want to be done and correct it. Yeah. When you have, I think when you have a good crew, half the time, you're just a safety officer, you know, I mean, in yeah. the end, right, right yeah, now, I don't, young, I don't do anything. Young crew, I don't do anything when I come to work right now. Yeah, I don't do anything young, when I come to work. Yeah. If you have a young crew and you got to tell them what to do, that's one thing. But right. a lot of the time I'm just a safety officer. Like, oh, maybe, maybe we take a minute and not do that. Or they know what, they know what they need to do. Certain crews that they have experience and you don't, you don't need to get involved in the nitty gritty, but I'll get into it a little bit later. Sometimes you do need to get involved in it. And I think that's one of the, you know, so I'll kind of run into, in terms of fires, emergencies, I think, George's point was great. Um, and I'll just expand on it quick, prepare what you can prepare for. You cannot prepare for every run that you go to. Um, but you shouldn't have to be, you shouldn't have to be, it shouldn't even be a thought on how to stretch a line or how to mask up properly, quickly, how to use the the equipment that you have, uh, because you're going to have to figure out other stuff on scene. Like why is this 500 amp breaker popping or, you know, whatever, 
but it shouldn't be the basics that you have to figure out on scene. So I think that's a really good point still. And I don't care career and volunteer seeing guys mask up is sometimes just brutal. Uh, you know, I'll be ready to go. And it's just like, yo, what are you doing? So, you know, and that's, and I kind of, not that there's an excuse for things like having trouble climbing an aerial because that's something we can practice, but let's be real climbing an aerial, uh, stretching a line, cutting up a car. Those are things you can't just go and do yourself, right? George can't just say, Hey, I'm going to go cut up a car or I'm going to go throw the aerial by myself. You know, you do need a crew to do that. Things like masking up, donning your gear, uh, that's stuff that you can do by yourself in the firehouse. So to me, there's really no excuse if you're not donning your PPE properly or quickly, because that's something you don't need any help to practice. Um, for me, daydreaming is a big, it, it helps me tremendously. And when I say daydreaming, we're Tell driving us. down this, what's up? <laughs> Tell us about your daydreaming. <laughs> we're driving down the street. I'm looking at buildings and I'm making up fires in them. And I'm saying, all right, if fire is at the second floor, what would be my size up and what would I do? Uh, you know, back when I was in the truck, if I was the OV, where am I going on this building? If I'm the roof, how am I getting to the roof? And, yeah. you know, you go to a water leak and, you know, it's a BS water leak, but you, and I'm not saying you treat it as a fire, but you come out and say, all right, if this was a fire and it was here or there, where am I going? Um, that's something that helps me tremendously. When I get on scene, the first question I ask myself, is anyone going to die? From what I see in the street, is someone going to die? And, and very obviously, usually the, the answer is no. In the case where it's a yes, then that kind of dictates what you have to do initially. Uh, I think very, you know, and kind of simplify it. I also, I'm not a huge acronym guy, but I think Recio VS is a pretty good, if you're looking for my opinion, if you're looking for something to kind of guide you, I think that on the same token of, is someone going to die is a decent way to kind of get started. Uh, so rescue, do we have to rescue anybody? If it's a fire exposures, uh, containing the fire, extinguishing overhaul event, and you know, those come later. But uh, I, I think that if, if you're looking for something priority wise, I think that can usually help a lot of guys out and to get started. But um, if you guys have noticed, there's one common theme and that's make a decision. And, uh, you know, it's not a new saying, but uh, a, a paralysis through analysis. If you just sit there and try to analyze the situation forever and never make a decision, things definitely cannot get better. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that that is, you know, you, you have to make a decision right or wrong. You have to get going on something. Even if you stretch an inch or three quarter instead of a two and a half, or you stretch it to the rear instead of the front, get water on the fire, get the known life hazard taken care of, and you're probably going to be well within your way to uh, a successful incident. Um, and then I'll just, you know, back to what you said, how many times do you hear he did nothing till he got promoted? And I got to tell you, that's equal in the volunteer and the career. Um, you know, the guy got promoted, whether it be volunteer or career. And then all of a sudden it went to his head, started bossing everyone around. Um, that's not the person anyone on here probably wants to be. So just keep that in mind. Just because you're the boss doesn't mean you need to boss everybody around. Yes, you have to make the decision when it's time for the decision to be made. But that doesn't mean that you can't treat people with respect in the way you'd want to be treated. The last thing I will say is my mantra for scenes, if you will, is if things go well, it was the guys, you know, it was a team effort, whatever happened, we did it. We made it happen. If things don't go well, there's one person to blame. And that's me. I don't blame my guys. If things go wrong, I don't care if the guy broke the saw because he didn't know how to start it because you know why he didn't know how to start it because we didn't teach him to start it properly. Okay. So <laughs> I don't even, oh, there you go. So, <laughs> If some, something goes wrong, then, then it's your fault. And, and I don't mean fault as in you need to be disciplined and blamed, and we'll talk about that later, but it's your responsibility to get your guys trained. So that's my thought on that. Um, I'll open it up to either of you two if you have anything else, and then we can go on to the next topic. Real quick, Dan, uh, you know, it's funny on the volunteer side, you see a lot of times kids, you know, 19 years old getting promoted, you know, to a lieutenant, and they just – it's tough, right? So I would say whether you're a career or volunteer, just from day one, set set the foundation 
And if you're thrown into that position, even if you're, you know, a brand new acting lieutenant on a career job, you know, and you're just unsure, like work with the people you got and make a sound decision, take a deep breath and, you know, have at it, but always try to better yourself. And, and you kind of alluded to it before, but use the knowledge around you. And that doesn't just have to be the knowledge on your crew. Although certainly if you're going to an electrical emergency and you got a guy that does electric, you know, elect, uh, is an electrician on the side, sure. then that's a huge advantage, but use, uh, use everybody. Um, for us, the big thing is the building engineers. Obviously we're going to a, a whole different ball game in terms of some buildings, but I don't walk into these buildings having any idea how they work, but usually the engineer does. So as long as it's within the realm of safety, he's coming with me and showing me exactly what the issue is and how to do it. But same thing, if you go to a house under construction and, and the electrician's there, or you're going to a gas leak and the gas company's there. These are the guys that do it every day. So, you know, use them to your advantage. Um, you know, I think that that's something that sometimes some guys will get, oh, we're the fire department back away. This is our scene. And yes, it is our scene and we're in charge, but use those around you that have, have knowledge in that, in those specific things. So. Um, all right. So around the firehouse. So now we're not talking about on scene, we're talking around the firehouse. How much or how little do you get involved in daily policies at the firehouse? Do you have a senior man? Uh, you know, kind of expand on that a little bit. So George, why don't you go ahead? Um, so it varies. Um, they just made um, senior lieutenants. So basically like station captains, so they're station lieutenants. Um, which I'm hearing is working out pretty decent. Um, at headquarters, again, there's seven of us there. Uh, the other stations have three career. And then there's volunteers that mix like headquarters with volunteers that take care of a squad. Um, we really don't have much interaction on the day-to-day -day with them there. Um, they kind of do their thing and we do ours. Um, but in the other stations, you know, there's, there's some uh, stations where the volunteers are there a lot. And there's a lot more interaction, so it just depends on how the crews work with each other and, and from there. Um, the senior man thing, you know, happens in some areas and it doesn't, uh, but basically it's the officers um, that'll say what, you know, is up for the day, uh, et cetera, training, all that stuff, which they get from the shift commander. When it comes to like house duties, uh, a lot of times you'll find a senior guy, you know, if not the junior guys, a lot will step in. Um, and say, hey, let's go, whatnot. And then usually everybody gets together. Um, but I, I would say it's a mix. It's not really set in stone. Everybody's different. Okay. Mike? Oh, yeah, similar. Um, you know, I, I, I'm i kind of beating it to death here. I, I utilize a senior man. I'm fortunate right now um, that my senior guy was my also my, my mentor when I was a, a probie. So uh, he works for me now, which is great. Um, I honestly, I don't do anything when I come to work because it's already, it's generally already done. So like, he's got, uh, I give him a lot of latitude to, they make the riding rotations The I don't even know what their cleaning stations are. I don't even know what they do because they just do it. Um, you know, they'll be involved with doing the station, uh, medical supplies. Uh, you know, I think all I do is order, order toilet paper. Um, you know, uh, but as far as drills, uh, currently, I don't know where my assignment is going to be now, but currently I work on the squad. So we have tons of equipment and pretty much the, cut, the drill. Mike, I'll cut you off. That's the next topic. So I'll, okay. uh, I'll just. Okay. This All right. So just around. Time. Okay. So yeah, we're just around the firehouse. Um, pretty much uh, I, I utilize them. Um, I, but most, most guys are the officer kind of gives the marching orders for the day uh, training. Um, yeah comes yeah, down from the uh, no I think, I think that's i think that's further too but uh, yeah I'm, I'm similar with you i don't i don't need to get involved in who's cleaning toilets or anything like that um but i think and you know i think it's a very important aspect to you're, you're the boss but you can still include everyone in the planning stages and what i mean by that is you know yes you're in charge of what goes on for the day where when you're going to drill uh, you know that type of stuff but that doesn't mean that you need to be the sole person to make those decisions and so you know we don't have we don't do a formal roll call i mean yes the regulations we do a formal roll call but you know 
at some point I'll get together in the morning with the senior guys and you know, who's ever, usually it's whoever's driving me and say, Hey, what do you need to do today? And it's like, Oh, we got to, you know, this broke. So we're going to run by home Depot and pick this up. Yes. They're actually home depots in midtown. Um, and we need to go pick this up or it's, you know, it's our day to get the meal and okay. And what do you have to do? Well, uh, we have to get one building done or we have to do these many hydrants or something like that. Uh, you know, so it's, it's a give and take. It's not, all right, we're going to do X, Y, and Z today, you know, and if they came to me and said, Hey, listen, um, you know, we want to do a drill with them today. Uh, do you mind if we put off doing hydrants today? You know, it's, it, that, that's not an issue. Um, you know, so it's something that we can always, uh, you know, kind of discuss like that. I think, um, but I think it's important to have that dialogue. I never liked when a boss just said, Hey, we're going out to do a building and that was it, or we're going out to do hydrants. You know, I kind of like to know, are we doing three blocks of hydrants or are we doing, you know, 10 blocks worth of hydrants? Just, you know, just kind of have an idea of what's going on. Um, so I, I like to kind of have that set what we're going to do. Hey, we're going to do one building today. We're going to do two building, whatever the case may be. So I think that that helps. And then be flexible. I think being flexible in the fire service is extremely important. We're, we're, we're flexible in every scene we go to, right? We pull up, we we say we're going to stretch an inch through the quarter. We do our 360, find someone hanging out of a window. We don't say, hey, sorry, we're stretching a line. See ya. You know, we have to be flexible. And I think the same goes with our daily routines. If there is the plan of doing X, Y, and Z drill or doing a building, and then you get a couple runs, maybe a small fire, you got to get the meal. Maybe that just has to get put on the back burner for that day or something. And I think that that's something that some people don't adjust too well and you end up it's four o'clock and you haven't eaten yet. And no one's happy. Um, you know, cause you know, the most two most important things are well rested and fed firemen. So that's the most important safety aspect. So I think that's important uh, to be able to be flexible in terms of the daily routine as well. Uh, and like I said, just kind of communicate it. Um, but yeah, senior man for me does pretty much everything. Now in terms of the volunteer fire service, you know, every, every place is different. Uh, some will hire cleaning people, uh, some will clean themselves, but I think the aspects are the same, especially that 19, 20 year officer, because that, that is what we see. You still have to, in my opinion, as long as you're going to get it from him as well, you have to respect the senior guys that have been there for a while. Now, I definitely think that there is, it, it can definitely be harder for a younger officer and an older senior guy in a volunteer fire department than there is for a younger officer and an older, more senior guy in a, in a career department. I think that there's a different dynamic there. Um, but I think you have to, if you're going to be successful in your department, you have to figure out how to take their knowledge and still use them for the younger guys and, uh, and, and you know, things like that, that I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more. So I don't want to get too, long-winded but dan dan that, that's important because what you guys are saying is that you have to get you have to understand from both sides right so put yourself back in the shoes when you were an officer and just the communication probably is the biggest thing mm -hmm. so um like you were mentioning about starting the day you know hey guys what do you, what do you got today you know you got to hit the bank you got to you know wh whatever it may be right you know, hey, one of the guys is like, hey, I wanted to check this saw, you know, on the rig. Cool. You know, that wasn't even a plan. Um, I think that little bit of the back and forth, be stern when you need to be stern. And I'm learning that. But yet, most of the time, try and work as a team, work as a crew, as a family. Everybody's got things they need to do or, or things that they need to learn on and whatnot and work together. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would definitely echo that. Uh, you, you hit the routine, Dan. That's something I, I wrote down, but I forgot that I skipped over. Uh, is you know set that stability up for your for your day. Like, because when you're off, all that stuff still has to happen. If you just kind of are a rudderless ship, every day you don't know, no really knows what's happening when they come to work, and they get a covering officer, and it's like, oh, you know, I don't know what to do today. Now, what do you do? Well, well, the boss usually tells us what to do, so we don't really know what to do. So. Yeah, no, no doubt. So, so I want to get into what we brought up, what you were starting on, because I truly think drills, training is one of the most important parts. Um, and I think it obviously has a name, drill or training. But as I will get into, I think that it doesn't have to be formal. I think that's a big part of it. Um, so let's talk. What uh, 
how are your drills run? Who comes up with the topics? How do you decide what to drill on? Take it away. Uh, Mike, why don't you start with us? Because you were alluding uh, sure. to before. Uh, yeah, so we have, you know, obviously there's annual stuff that is required, whether it's OSHA training or whatever, that, that comes down from the training office. We do have a training officer uh, who is like ultimately responsible for the training, um, delegating it out. The company officers, you know, will work with each other to, to set up multi-unit drills or um, single company stuff. Um, but for me, usually we'll just start. Part of my my day is we we take something off the truck every time. So because the work on the squad, we have tons of equipment. It's it's a perishable skills. A lot of that stuff is you know that's kind of like a buzzword too, perishable skill, right? Um, you know whether it's ropes or you know, uh, shoring or struts, airbags, meters, pretty much someone will just take something off the truck and be like, oh, hey, you know, the meter has to be calibrated today. So, okay, well, let's talk about it while it's off. You know, we'll run through the PID or whatever. The drills are really not set in stone unless we can line something up. Like if we can get a couple cars, we'll say, all right, next few shifts, we're going to be drilling on, you know, extrication, stabilization stuff. But most of the time, it's the the guys. I let them it usually starts around the kitchen table. Like, hey, you know, we start talking about something, or hey, did you see this happen in you know so and so the place, or you know this job this happened over here. Or, I talked to my buddy that works here. They just had this crazy call, you know. And then we start trying to talk about how would we handle that with the equipment that we have, um, and then it kind of just goes from there because it the environment that we we create is is up and down, right? So it, I'm learning everything also as much as I'm teaching stuff. Um, you know, so I, I don't, I won't say that that's everywhere though. You know, some days it's like, okay, well, this is the drill. This is the drill. This is the drill. We have to hit this. We have to hit this. We have to hit this, which I, I don't like training just to, for sake of training because no one's really into it. If you find something that's kind of hitting nerve, then we just kind of run with it and we go from there and see where it goes. Um, but it, part of the scheduled day, right? So training for, for us is like anywhere between 10 in the morning to, to about lunch and then afternoons off, unless we have to do a training in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. um, it is usually, usually the company officers, like I said, uh, the battalion chief doesn't usually get, the shift commander doesn't usually get involved uh, with scheduling anything. Only thing he'll, he'll weigh in on is if you're moving companies around town to like, schedule so that there's still coverage available so that you're not draining all, all the pieces from one side to come down to, to drill on something. That's pretty much as far as the battalions get involved is just kind of managing that piece of it. Um, cool. We're going to stay on this topic for a little bit, I think. So I'll let George go and then I'm sure we'll come back to, to you. I've, I've highlighted a couple of the questions that kind of came up later that are on this topic too that we'll address. So George, how does uh, training work for you guys? Uh, training division sets the calendar. Um, it's, I don't know, a, a lot of times there's uh, two to three hour training. So they'll take half the shift and you go to that, whether it's hazmat training, confined space. Uh, we all basically have hazmat, um, trench rescue, confined space, rope rescue. We're all pretty much trained in that. And we have every piece of equipment you can imagine. Um, you know, sometimes those are long days because half the shift is training in the morning and then the other half is covering 50 square miles and then vice versa, you know, you flip flop. Um, but lately they've, they've been trying to change it up where they do three different segments um, and then try and shorten it a little bit. So that that's definitely better. Um, you know, it's always encouraged that a company does their own training. Um, you know, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, depending on the day, depend, what not. Um, I find that, um, a lot lately we've been trying to do stuff at headquarters the best we can, um, you know, but it's hit or miss. Um, I think, you know, Mike, you mentioned it and it's huge. It's like, maybe you went on a call last tour that was just a fire alarm, but you're like, Hey, you know, I didn't understand that the back was like this or the interior stairs, you know, so we got nothing going on next tour. Let's go take a trip over there for 45 minutes and take a look, you know, and that sometimes that stuff is just the cream of the crop you know, mm -hmm. stuff you didn't expect, whatnot. Um, and then just, you know, talking to other guys about calls they went on, you know, because then you could kind of quarterback those calls and, and 
you, you learn a lot. I, I personally love talking to people because I don't go to fires just like you. Um, I love to talk to the guys and the girls that go to these calls, uh, these fires. And it's like, you know, everything. I want to know what water supply, I want to ventilation, all of it. Because like you said, you, you, if you think you know everything, then walk away because you shouldn't be here. So you should be learning all the time. So I think it's important. But again, we're just a training calendar and we go from there. So. Yeah, so we're, I mean, we have a training calendar, um, but it's a guide. It, it's not something set in stone. It's just kind of to give the boss the ability, you know, kind of set an idea. But uh, some of the stuff we have, we have very few out of service training where, you know, you'll get a ticket, you'll go to the rock or you'll go to a satellite location and you'll do training out of service. It does happen, but it, it's certainly not that common. And frankly, even if the training's good, um, and sometimes it is just like any training. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Even if the training is good, it's, I don't want to say a morale killer, but it's its not a morale booster to be out of service to go do training. Now, are there times you have to? Absolutely. But there is nothing that will kill morale, like being at the rock and watching the header from your first do fire that you're missing because you're at the rock. So you know, I, I think, you know, it, granted, it's probably different in Greenwich. If you're out of service and something comes in, I'm sure they could, you know, let you go to, to a yeah. fire or something like that. Yeah. Um, but I, just in general, I think that that is something that hurts sometimes with morale of what training is or what training is supposed to be uh, and try to stay in service as much as you can. That doesn't mean that the training can't be good or can't be interesting. Um, on the volunteer side, I've been a huge proponent uh, of training. I always thought that uh, you know, one of the assistant chiefs said, so goes training, so goes the department. And I think that's extremely true in the volunteer fire service, more so than the career fire service. I think when people are giving away their time for free, um, they expect something in return. And that's not a selfish thing, but if you're gonna give up three hours of your Monday or Tuesday or whatever night to go do training, the last thing you want is the officer to walk in, you know, a half hour late with no plan, and then whatever he comes up with doesn't really know how to do it. Um, so I, I think that, you know, that is the, I, I think not from a safety aspect, I think safety aspect training is training is as important as anywhere, but I think from a morale aspect, training in the volunteer fire service is almost more important than it is in the career service in terms of keeping guys interested, keeping guys coming around, keeping guys feeling like they're firefighters and things like that. Um, yep. In the on the career side, again, I try to do training in the morning. I try to keep the afternoons open. Um, but you know, more and more guys want to do it. They'll come up at, to the office at two o'clock and say, "Hey, you want to do a quick drill?" Sure. I think the other kind of negative connotation that training can get is sometimes people think if it's not a three-hour drill, it's useless. When I worked at the bicycle shop. Uh, you know, I would go out for like a, a 45 minute bike ride. And, and the guy there was like, unless you ride for an hour and a half, it's not worth it. And it's like, what is that? Like, you know, some of the best drills I've done are half hour, 15, 20 minutes discussion about something. And so I, I find us doing more multiple half hour drills throughout the day than one hour and a half drill. And I think guys stay more engaged. Um, I, I think it, you can cover more topics. And it just, it seems to be fairly well received. And that's, that's on them. I mean, a lot of times, like I said, I'll usually start one drill and then next thing I know they're doing something else because it rolled in from something else, you know, another topic or a discussion, obviously calls are, are a great way to refresh on something. Um, the topics I choose again, you know, I'm fortunate right now. I got, I have one probie. I have a few guys that are here for a year. We have a rotation program now. So I'm fortunate that I have that fresh new blood. Um, whereas, you know, you basically have to train with them because they're, they're newer and, and they have a lot. not that you have to train with them versus others, but we're really hitting the basics, which is awesome. Uh, so I'm very fortunate with that. I have great guys that want to do it. And uh, so it's fun too. Um, but I think that that's important. The other aspect from it with the volunteer fire service that I always found tough was um and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with officers. Let, let's just be frank, you know, elections are usually based off of some sort of point system, some sort of activity requirement. And there, there are those guys that say, unless I'm getting credit for this drill, I'm not going to show up. 
And so then it became, well, this drill went over four hours. Do I get credit for two points? Because, it, you know, why, why am I going to show up for an eight hour drill and get one point when I can show up for a Tuesday night, two hour drill and get one point? And mm -hmm. I understand both sides of it. Again, they're giving up time. Um, and if they're giving up eight hours, shouldn't they get more credit? But at the same time, what are we really here for? And, and that, listen, we're not going to, we, we could spend eight hours talking about how to deal with point systems in the volunteer fire service. And that's obviously not what we're here for tonight, but that, that makes it tough to kind of say, Hey, you want to come drill? Oh, well, how much, how much credit am I going to get for it? Cause I've heard that. It's like, how about you just come and have fun, you know, but yep. it's neither here nor there. So that's some of the stuff I have with, with training. Um, and again, it, it, in terms of who runs it, maybe I'll start it, but I absolutely turn to everybody and say, well, what, who's been to a call here that, that relates to what we're doing here. Um, and, and admittedly, sometimes we've done trainings because things didn't go well at a call. You know, we, we went to a, a car accident and uh, a, a tool or two wasn't taken or a tool wasn't used properly. And so, Hey, you know, next door guys, let's go over these tools, make sure we're, uh, we're on board with them. And, and what I could say, probably the most important thing is don't take anything for granted. I know, uh, George and I talked about this the other day, um, but don't take anything for granted just because you got a guy that's got five years on the job. Don't assume that he's done it before, you know? Um, and that doesn't mean you need to berate him and say, how do you not know how to do X, Y, and Z, but we can still go over the basics, uh, changing sawzall blades, uh, operating a hearse tool, you know, all stuff like that are perishable skills. And if you're not using them on the side, you know, you may, it's always good to go over that stuff. So don't take any of that for granted that uh, everyone knows how to do everything. Um, it, Dan, a lot of times you hear like generational and I'm not going to say, you know, every generation is different, right? But like you said before, something goes bad, it's on you as the officer. Well, it's the same thing. Like if all these new people come in, whether it's volunteer career, it's up to the people that have come before them to lay the foundation. You know, they should be eager on both sides, volunteer career to want to learn, but it should be from the people that have three, five, 10, 20, 40 years on that teach these people. Cause if you don't teach them, how are they supposed to learn? It's like, if you go to a call and you've never done this call before, you're going to go back to your training. Well, if you didn't train on it, what are you going to do? Well, it's 50, 50 at that point, you know? So it's always important to just kind of pat, you know, you hear always pass it on and it's true. It really is. Well, and for new guys, I always, the airbags is always a good example. Like I always tell them, I don't, you know, a probie or a guy with one or two years, I don't expect you to figure out what bags are we going to use? Where are we going to put them? Uh, you know, where are we going to lift from that stuff? I'll figure that out. The senior guy will figure that out. I need you to be able to hook them up seamlessly so that neither of us have to help you hook up the yellow hose to the bag so that we can concentrate on the actual operation. And so I think starting out at the beginning too, not having unrealistic expectations. Uh, everyone that I know that's been a volunteer that went to the, that got hired and went to a recruit school, being a volunteer helped them tremendously. Uh, again, you're not, you're not learning how to put your gear on, your SCBA on for the first time. You've stretched a hose line before. You probably have fire one and two. So, you know, again, it, it, it just all that, th those basic stuff, they're perishable skills and you just, they're, 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 um, you know, you just, you can't get them anywhere else. You know, it's not like you're going to join the Boy Scouts and learn how to stretch a line or don FCBA. So they're just, they're invaluable when it comes to that stuff in the future. But if you don't have the basics, you can't learn the more advanced stuff, as you guys have been saying. So Mike, anything yeah. else? Uh, yeah, just one thing. It kind of piggybacks on what George said. Uh, something that really irks me is when, uh, you know, you hear someone talking about a guy like, oh, this guy he sucks, you know. Mm -hmm. uh you just see him the other day he did this or whatever so my first thing is well did you stop him and correct him and teach him the correct way to do it or are you just going to talk shit about him while he's not here you know because that's that's not helping anybody you know yeah maybe the guy might might suck but <laughs> you got to still help him you got to you know stop him and say hey this do you, do you realize that that's not exactly the way we want to be doing that you know and then but if you're just going to go around and talk if you don't Sorry, help him, you suck just as worse. Yeah, exactly. You, I think you suck worse if you don't help him. And and this was something again, George and I and I, Mike, you were in this conversation too. Like, 
yes, there's a lot of talk of the new generation, the new generation. And you could even make the argument, well, who, who brought them up? But I guess we did, right? Because they're our kids. But never mind that. <laughs> as long as they're willing to learn, I'm in, right? So we had, right. a, Absolutely. A, a kid, we had a kid that came, uh, you know, he grew up in the projects. He had never, you know, starting a saw, someone said, you st- started like your lawnmower. And he said, I've never had a lawnmower. But you know what? He was willing to learn. So who cares? You know, right. when you have someone come in and say, he doesn't know how to use a screwdriver, you know, F him. It's like, is he willing to learn? Now, if he says, oh, I don't need to know that. All right. Now we got a well, problem. The, I'm with you. Story. But as long as he's willing to learn and, and, you know, figure, figure it out with us, I'm in because you know what, those same guys that maybe aren't tool capable, if you will, when you need something done on the iPad, because our new pre-planned software, maybe you need them to fill out your uh, run reports, George. I bet they could do it in two seconds without even needing any help. So I bucks you know, a call. I'm willing to pay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Everyone's got a place and it's just figuring out where that place fits in because not everyone's going to be good at everything. But, um, you know, and again, that goes to the senior man or the guy that's an electrician. Like maybe he needs to run your utility, uh, you know, your, your, your utility drill. And yeah, maybe the new guy doesn't know how to shut a breaker off because he never had to. But if he's willing to learn and you got someone willing to teach him, that's all you need. You know, and again, I guarantee if you run that basic drill, it'll keep everyone fresh and someone will learn something. So on that topic, we're not getting off of it completely, but we're going to expand on it because this was a question, kind of a combination of a few questions. How do you lead a variety of different people with different experience and interest level involved? And a couple of the examples was the senior guy that doesn't want to do anything or the 220 junior guys. So first I'll, uh, I'll let George explain what a 220 junior guy is. You know, I assume you know, right? Uh, two months on the job. Think he's yeah, got exactly. 20 years experience. Exactly. So it's someone that doesn't have a lot of calendar time, but acts like they have a lot of time. So how do you how do you blend leading all these different people in the fire service? I think it's a matter of a foundation, right? So if you stay consistent, um, you're going to have the ones that, like you said, don't want to, the ones that do want to stay consistent and just show the, the reasoning behind it, the need for it. Um, yeah, initially it might not flow very well. Um, and you might have to hammer down a little, you might have to, you know, push it a little more than you want to, but at the end of the day, and I had to say that for my buddy, uh, at the end of the day, you know, I, I think if you just stay consistent, that's obvious that to me is one of the biggest things um, and treat everybody the same. And then another good one is, let's just say, you know, you have a junior firefighter that's really intrigued, really energetic. And let's say there's a senior one that's really not, um, you know, I can remember, uh, I'm getting texts like crazy and it's awesome. I can remember my time of, you know, you have ups and downs in a firehouse. I think everybody's human. So there's times where you're just in a slump and then there's times where you're sky high. Um, if you, if you can get the involvement from different sides to maybe help you. So, you know, like you were saying, an electrician on a rig or something, if you're talking about X, Y, Z, and then there's somebody, you know, on the job or in a volunteer house that has that experience, but doesn't really want to get involved, try and get that from them. Um, you know, Hey, you know, I know you put in electrical panels. I'm really not good with it. You know, what do you find? Like what's some of the problems? And sometimes you'll find that they'll just, it's almost diarrhea of the mouth. Like they'll just come right out and before you know it, they're helping, you know? So that, that's another good way to look at it. I actually think that's one, one advantage of the volunteer fire service over the career fire service is you're getting guys from every background. And in reality, you probably get a more diverse level of expertise outside of the firehouse um, than you do, you know, in a career job. There are guys obviously in career jobs that have good side hustles, if you will, of skills, but that's literally what you're getting in the volunteer fire service. And I definitely think that that's underutilized in general for training um, on a lot of that stuff, builders for building construction, uh, you know, so a lot of that stuff as well. What about, what about you, Mike? Um, I think it, it goes to consistency. I think it goes like when you, when you do take over your, your crew, uh, the first thing I like to do, and it's, this is not like secret or anything, you know, 
uh, is lay out your expectations because some some people if you don't tell them what you expect of them they don't really know so i think if you lay out your expectations like one of my my thing is i don't really care what you do on your off days you you don't have to listen to you know new york on the scanner and listen to dango to fires or whatever Jay mccarthy um, yeah, <laughs> you know, you, you don't have to do that. But when you're at work, I expect you to be at work, you know, come to work, ready to work, come to work, you know, with uh, with an open mindedness to, to do to do stuff, to do new stuff. Um, and I think that eventually it, it takes time, right? If you have someone who is completely uninterested, it takes time and you don't have the you just have to continue doing the same thing you do all the time, every day, every day, every day until, you know, your expectations become the norm and you're bringing up, hopefully there's other people where there's not, you don't have a whole crew of, you know, four or five guys that are just uninterested in the job. If you are doing the same thing over and over every day, your expectations are high. You're driving your people to raise their expectations over time. They either will raise their expectations or they won't. And the ones that, that won't, I think it's the hard thing to say is that you, you may not be able to change their mind. There's some people you just can't change their mind, you know, and you just have to revert to some more tough love kind of things. Or if you, if you're in a position where you have to use progressive discipline or whatever at that point, but I don't think it ever has to get that far. If you just constantly are hammering away at the same, same stuff every day, mindset, mindset. Um, and it, fluctuates up and down with morale right so if you're if you if your guys are in a downswing it's like a bad bad time of year bad whatever everybody gets in a funk and you got to give people the opportunity to get out of the funk and i think it's by setting the bar leading by doing what you you say you want them to do by doing it yourself you know i, I that's just my opinion i think that if it some people you you, you won't you won't be able to help i i did have somebody he, he ended up resigning from, from the fire department, but I was the third officer that got to him. One of his first officers was a guy who was a Navy SEAL, right? If he basically labeled this, this fella untrainable. So like for, for the caliber of that person to say that this guy he can't be trained, he's kind of a slug, nothing else you're going to do about it. I think it speaks volumes and there's nothing that I was going to do to change it. And it just didn't work out for him. So I think that's kind of a long-winded answer to just being consistent and setting the bar high. I think I being think, consistent uh, and leading by example are two very important things. And it, it's not, I don't think anyone's hundred percent consistent all the time. We all have bad days. I can look right. back at days where I went to work and said, you know what, that was not the person I wanted to be that day. Um, and I just need to do better next time. You know, George, what were you going to say? Hey, Mike, I think the biggest thing you said is expectation. You know, that is, in a volunteer system or career, doesn't matter, right? So volunteer, you volunteer to go in. And then at that point, once you're in, there's expectations of you. Whether they're high or low, there's got to be expectations. And the same on the shift, right? The, the start of the shift, et cetera, whether it's the deputy, the lieutenant, there's that, they, they have to pass the expectation down. Because if you're going to, like one big thing that I'm a fan of is reverse laying. So with us, the first two goes directly in, second do grabs a water source, reverse lay it out. But I'll tell the driver, this way they're not wondering. I'm a fan of reverse laying. I'm not saying we're going to do it all the time, but majority is reverse lay. Now, if we pull up, they have an understanding. We don't have to worry about it at that moment. So not very, very good. Dead on. And I don't think there are always going to be them, but I – seen unmotivated people that even when everyone is doing something they will right, that, they will just, get up and do it also like know? osmosis they you, you make them feel left out at that point right. you know they're they're not doing enough at that point so and i think george kind of alluded to this before i don't know when the best place to put it in so i'll just put it in now is is what's going on in people's personal lives and i think that that's a a very under talked about kind of aspect to this um certainly in a career department where you're spending many times 24 hours at a time with someone I think it's easier to pick out hey that guy's not acting right um, but I, I think that's a, a major role of the officer too is to maybe pick out when things aren't going well uh, you know someone's going through a divorce or god forbid you know lost someone uh, you know death wise 
uh, you know, the, that's, it's not our job to be counselors. It's not our job to be social workers, but uh, in a way it is at the same time, um, meaning we're not going to give professional help, but we can certainly be an ear. We can certainly, you know, talk to them, give them the tools. There's, you know, now, nowadays, very fortunate that there's a lot of tools that are at our disposal for, you know, help with, with pretty much any issue that you have out there. And so I think that that's an important aspect when you get into, especially if you have someone that's acting like they don't, don't normally do like, Hey, this guy's always first up to drill. And now he's, you know, on the couch or, or whatever the case may be. So I think that's uh, something to consider as well. Um, all right. So a couple other questions that we have, uh, just general qualities and foundations that you recommend that a firefighter builds upon for a future in leadership. So time-wise, since I said, we're going to, you know, kind of do this, we're, we're probably not going to go past nine fifteen or so. Um, you know, so we'll try to get through these last few questions. So types of qualities and foundations that you recommend that a firefighter builds upon for a future in leadership. That's kind of an open-ended question, but is there anything, and this kind of, this question kind of comes from a few different people that said, you know, maybe I want to be an officer someday. What should I start working on now? Uh, what kind of skills should I start working on now? Things like that. So uh, George, why don't you go ahead? Um, did you send that one over again? Yeah, yeah I just, you just put it in the thing. You just put it in there. What type of qualities and foundations do you recommend? I mean, I'll I'll let you read that. I mean, for me, again, I think it's and you're not gonna listen. I you're not gonna be you're gonna have your days, but again, knowing the basics, knowing the equipment, knowing the stuff on the truck, um, I think that's a huge foundation. You know, my lieutenant's test. I would say almost half the questions were just basic questions on types of equipment, specs on the equipment. The really? idea of a lieutenant is being able to teach the younger guys. So you need to know your equipment forward and back. And that's something, again, that you can learn by yourself. You don't need an officer there in the volunteer service or career. If the guys are doing their paperwork or doing whatever, studying, you can do that yourself. So know your equipment front and back, know where it is, know how it works. You're not always going to know when to use it, but at least when the officer says we need to use that grip hoist, you're going to know how it operates and he doesn't have to show you how the levers work. So I think that's, again, that sounds like a simple thing, but that's to me, the most important thing is knowing the rig and knowing how every single thing on it works. I think that's fair. Mike? Um, yeah, be coachable, be coachable and, uh, you know, have an open mind. Okay. I think another good one is, uh, just continual education, right? Hands-on, any kind of classes, any online stuff, anything you can do, uh, reading material, et cetera. Um, and then I think we said it before, but just picking everybody's brains, right? You know, in, in the basic level, there's so much more that you can do, but, um, the more that you try to saturate your your brain with it, you know, you're going to take stuff from it. So don't don't be a slug and not try to if you're not going to try and learn in any way. If you become an officer, it's kind of going to come along with you. And now you might need to backpedal. I'm not saying that you can't better yourself and become uh, good at it, but, you know, you're gonna have to backpedal a lot. So. Say also, if we could add one more thing is take classes, take classes along the way, stay training, stay current on stuff. Um, you know, like I said, even if you, you go way beyond into the advanced stuff and then you do take that job as an officer and then you scale back to re-hit on the, the more basic uh, fire one, fire two stuff, um, you know, it, everyone benefits. And I think, I mean, I don't think online uh, pre-K is a good thing of COVID. But I think one good thing that's come out of COVID is all of these online stuff, because yes, most of you are local and you could probably take a class from us but locally. But, you know, if you look online, there's so much from very, very well-known names doing online stuff throughout the country. And, and so it does open up that exposure. And there are some great books out there. Um, so yeah, definitely open up your eyes, uh, you know, and, and just keep, keep studying, but know your stuff. And 
you know, we haven't really touched on that yet, but uh, have have pride in your department. And I know that that's something that we, George and I talked, George, Mike and I talked about it for a while, uh, but have pride in your department. We all, every department we have, volunteer or career, has issues. There is no perfect department out there. But if you don't have pride in your department or you don't think that you can make it better, then you might as well just resign and go to a different department. And you're probably just going to end up not working out there either. Because every department that has issues also has a lot of good things going on, I guarantee you. And that doesn't mean that the issues don't always outweigh the good things going on. That's not what I'm saying. I can think of a few off the top of my head. But if you can find the good things and expand on those, then you can make things better and you can uh, improve on and have pride in your department. So I think that's make sure they have a make sure they have a tiller and make sure they have power call. <laughs> power call, no railroad <laughs> race, no power call. Uh, my opinion, but. Uh, I know that's something we talked about though, is don't try to be another department. Don't try to, you know, if you're a, if you're a, a small town, don't try to act like a big city. If you're a big city, you can't act like a small town. And what, and I literally mean that because you can't, you're on an engine, you can't decide to do a search. You got to get a hose line operation and vice versa. If you're in a small town, you can't pretend that you're going to do 10 different things at once when you only show up with five guys initially. So you, talk, you talked about the uh, take pride. A lot of the guys right now are making up company patches. And here's an example of one. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's awesome to see, you know, for years it was back and forth and now these guys are just getting it done. It's a good thing. Absolutely. Um, so back next like up, we'll do... promoting speeding. What's up, Chris? Chris, did you want to say something? Is that is that Rockland County four four one? Uh oh. I don't know. I'm gonna mute him, but if he wants to say something again, just let me know. He, he um, <laughs> All right. First, so we'll run back a little bit. There were a couple questions about being a first two officer on the fire ground. So, size up tips: Are you taking or passing? So actually, there were a couple questions on you know your first action size up tips. And what are you doing with command? Are you taking it, passing it? Um, uh, yeah, that's about it. That's about enough. And how do you prioritize first and second do truck priority? So I'll put these up there. And if you guys want to uh, address them, then whoever wants to go first. So prioritizing uh, first and second do. So. Uh, basically on ours, uh, first engine arrival should give a solid size up. Again, it could be engine, truck, deputy. Um, just remember, and this is just my opinion, right? In a size up, don't be long-winded and don't be too short where you're not passing info. You know, you get on scene, let's say you got a, um, you know, a cape, you got fire showing from the number one floor, like just, you know, one's on scene. I, I, I got a one and a half story cape with fire showing from the number one floor you know, offensive, defense, whatever, but don't go way out. Another one that's important if your policies are not laid in place is that state what you're doing with water supply. We didn't grab a hydrant or we have our own hydrant or we laid in. Like you got to be able to pass the info, but don't take up so much time with it. Um, regarding Greenwich, first do again uh, goes directly in. Uh, second do is supposed to get a water source. When you get to the back country, it's obviously more different. You know, some driveways are a thousand feet. So uh, first two more than likely is not laying in and let a boss could change that if they want, that's their decision. Um, but just communicate. Like that's probably the biggest thing I find in any volunteer career is if you don't have like true policies then you got to communicate it. Um, it's almost like that expectation, right? If they don't know it, how do they know? Um, first two will take command um, and then they call the shots at that point. And there's nothing saying the deputy can't on the road, but the deputies are pretty good where they'll kind of hold off and let the lieutenants make those calls. And then when the deputy gets on scene, you know, more than likely it's right away, they just take it, you know, and it might just be a radio um, report instead of face to face. Um, and first actions is tough at that point. You know, it's like, like you said, you pull up, what do you have going on? You, you might have to hit it hard from the yard. You might have to. Where's your you patch know, of that? 
Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's somewhere. It's on my underwear. Uh-huh. Um, at that point, it's like, you know, every call is going to dictate what you do. It's not, you know, for us, we don't have all these companies arriving back to back to back. You might be delayed. So it's what the priority is and go from there. The bottom line is if the fire goes out, right? We always hear it. Fire goes out, things tend to get better. So but that's a basic of ours. Yeah. For, I mean, for us, we obviously have uh, on the career side, have, have, fairly rigid SOGs, P's in terms of how things are done by the first two companies. And like I said, in many ways, our chief officers for the first five to 10 minutes don't have a lot of responsibilities. And of course, I say this as a lieutenant, not a battalion chief, I'm sure if I ever get to that, I'll feel differently. But at least what I mean is they're not giving orders of engine one stretch an inch three quarter, engine two help them stretch and so on and so forth. A lot of those things are built in. In terms of in route, none of our uh, none of our chiefs really are going to dictate tactics. What they might do, though, depending on how things are going, is they could special call additional companies if they feel like it's needed. Um, so that's not a, unheard of to uh, you know special call additional companies, chiefs or whatever, uh, if they think so. I think communication is big, uh, and it's an easy thing to say. But God, it's just, it's horrendous to listen to some of these fire ground communications where the BS that's being talked about, and then you learn from talking to someone there that there was actually something important going on that wasn't communicated. You know, it was like, oh, you know, you're hearing, hey, uh, Jimmy, bring a ladder over here, blah, 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 do this, that. And then you talk to them when they get back. Yeah, man, we just did not have good water pressure on that hose line. It's like, well, why the hell didn't you say something? You know, so. I think that is one of the big pet peeves is, is the lack of communication sometimes. Um, and at the same time, there is, you know, face-to-face communication is something that does happen often. And I think it's very valuable. Uh, and I think it falls on the incident commander more than anything. And it's something that I brought up in a lot of my classes. But if I walk up to the incident commander and I say, hey, we're here, what do you need? And he says, hey, do me a favor, just stretch a backup line. All right. Well, that's not really something that that's important in terms of everyone on the fire ground knowing necessarily. But if I walk up and I say, hey, what do you need? And he says, hey, do me a favor, go up to the roof and cut a hole in the roof. Well, that's probably something that everyone on the fire ground should know is about to occur. Or that's something that every, you know, if I'm going to take a window or something, that's something probably everyone needs to know. Or you get sent to the floor above that the line, you know, so there are things that even if face to face communication is done probably needs to also be communicated on the radio. I'm digressing a little bit. So again, I think communicating, like George said, what you're going to do and what needs to be done. You know, if you're the first engine and you did not grab a water supply, making sure that the second two companies know that you didn't so that they do. Uh, And then just in terms of first action. So if you're not an officer or you're a new officer, uh, you know, there's always going to be these situations that are complicated, but for, I think the easiest thing to do, like I said, you you show up, is anyone about to die? If they are, we got to address it. From there, is it on fire? If it is, we got to extinguish it. If it's not, then we go investigate. And I think that can really, you know, obviously that's structural wise, but, you know, a lot of our calls smoke from a house, uh, you know, now with cell phones, I mean, we've had cell phones for a while, obviously, but we get 911 calls for everything. Like the person drove by and saw a flashing light and thought it was a fire. So, a lot of these calls, you know, you really just, just break it down into very simple, do I need to act right now? Is someone going to die or is something on fire? And if the answer to both is no, then you're kind of setting yourself up to go do an investigation. And if either of the answer is yes, then you're kind of telling yourself how to act in those specific scenarios as well. So Mike, what do you got? First do officer. Uh, being pretty similar. First do officer, uh, you know, if it's, if it's a fire call, it, we're assuming that we're we're command right we're taking combative command or whatever i don't say that on the radio i'll just show up give my size up and i'll start doing my 360 if it's if it is on fire and that's part of my transmission uh you know the backstep guy is gonna will communicate to him uh, he'll, they're usually guys are usually chomping at the bit to stretch a line you know if they see fire and stuff like that so i have no problem with them stretching while i do my 360 um you know, because then by that time they're ready to go. Water's at the door. We're we're ready to go to work. Um, 
And as, as the subsequent companies come in, like if the ladder shows up before the uh, battalion chief, uh, they're not going to take command either. They're just going to go to work and the battalion chief will take command uh, officially on the radio. Um, and then same thing, uh, coming in second, third do, uh, this is the first do, if you get your own hydrant, we have the south end of town, they have really good hydrants. So many times you can get your own hydrant as the first engine and the chauffeur will, will, will say that. Um, if not, sometimes they'll give directions to the truck if we have a lot of tight uh, one ways off one way streets. So they'll either, if they're not gonna pull past, they'll stop short and communicate that to the truck. Like, hey, we stop short, come in off this street to this street, you'll have the front of the building. Um, first actions, again, it's, it's situationally dictated. So I've worked as an officer at uh, the two stations that have rescue. So have a little bit more flexibility there because I have the, myself and two people on the engine plus two more people on, on the rescue. So I can, I can split that and get two, two things happening at one time, or we can do one thing together. Um, what's that rescue? Not really a rescue. Yeah, yeah. Rescue. Yeah. It's rescue, uh, emergency unit, whatever. Uh, we just nomenclature, I guess. Right. Uh, it, it doesn't have, uh, open rear doors where you can sit on the step. That's not our rescue. Well, I think, and then going back to the volunteer too, I, I think 90% of the time in the career fire service, the engine or the truck gets on scene first and 90% of the time in the volunteer fire service chief gets on scene first. Um, and I think that's a different dynamic to it. I think, I think that helps the chief 90, most of the time to be able to size the situation up and give good commands to the first arriving companies. I had a chief uh, when I was in the Bronx and we had a good job and he had just had a run up there and we got in first and we're like, how did you not get here? You were already up in this direction. He goes, are you kidding me? I drove around the block. I didn't want to get in first. What the hell am I going to do? <laughs> and it's just a different mindset. Whereas I don't know any, any, you know, volunteer chiefs that would say, Oh, uh, I hope the engine gets in first. And I understand it because you don't know what manpower you have. You don't know exactly what, you know, what you have going on or what the next arrival order is. And, and so it does give you the ability to kind of set up and, uh, and get a good idea of what's going on and, and get a 360 done. I mean, there's a huge advantage to not having to have the first company officer do a 360 if you have a chief there that's already done it. Because if, if you have a three-man company, you know, that's, that's basically a two-man company then for, for a minute or two while you do a 360. And there are some departments that may have the company officer do a 360 also, and that's fine too. I'm not here to tell you how to operate. Uh, I think a 360 has to be done. I will say that, but who does it? I'm not necessarily specific on. Um, so I just think that that's an interesting dynamic. George, I don't know if you have any, uh, you know, I've never been a chief officer, so I've never had, you know, I haven't had too many instances where I showed up first on scene of a fire in a volunteer department. So I don't know if you want to touch on that a little bit from your experiences. Yeah, I mean, I'm a whacker, you know, so I want to get out the door quick. Um, so there were several fires that I was able to arrive first on scene as a chief officer. Um, and, and I think you, you pretty much hit it. It's like you can now establish what's going on. Um, you know, my belief is it's no different than a deputy or a battalion in a career. Like they can, you know, get the picture and lay it out. But it is tough. Like you get on scene and it's hitting the fan. And you really don't have anything because I was always a fan of like the chief's car really shouldn't be carrying everything. You know, you'll see chief's cars with combi tools even in them. It's like, come on, like at some point you're a chief, right? Um, but yeah, I, I was a fan of, you know, trying to get there first and uh, establish whatnot. I think it's important. Okay, cool. Um, and you said 360? Yeah. I mean, there's so many line of duty deaths out yep. there, you know, so... And in, in, uh, in Greenwich, what we'll try to do in our company as an example is the nozzle guy, we, we switch to Minuteman 200 foot pre-connects. So he'll just deploy that. The chauffeur will help him, you know, and the officer's got to try and do a 360. If not, at least get to the Charlie side and see what's going on, see what the layout is like you have to. Yeah, I mean, obviously our buildings, depending on where you are in the city is going to be different. So in, in like, you know, private dwelling area, Bronx, Queens or whatnot, in many, uh, in many cases, uh, a 360 is easy, right? Um, on some buildings, 
certainly not so easy. Uh, a lot of times the roof, the guy on the roof will be the first true 360. You know, he'll get up on the roof and look over the back. It's really not the officer that's going to do a 360. It's going to be the outside vent man or the roof man. Yes, I know, you know, we have plenty of manpower, but in the same sense, someone has to do it and someone trustworthy has to do it. I remember a few times being in a, in Trumbull and, and saying to my chauffeur, like, hey, what you, you want to do a 360? For, like the, the homeowner's out front, right? Waving. And maybe yeah. there's some smoke. Um, why don't you do a 360 so I can go deal with this hysteria to begin mm -hmm. with? You know, so as, as long as I can trust him, I, I, someone's got to do it. But obviously, you're not sending a probie to do it or something like that. And not just uh, line of duty deaths from 360s, but uh, just not knowing where the fire is, is a big issue with line of duty deaths as you go through it. Um, and I've said it before, the NIOSH reports do paint a pretty good picture. If you're looking for some reading material, don't get, uh, don't get taken aback by a hundred plus line of duty deaths per year. We were talking about this the other day, because a lot of them, most of them are not structural firefighting related. So skip over the ones that deal with heart attacks, skip over the ones that deal with parking on the highway. I'm not trying to discount them, but when we talk about structural firefighting line of duty deaths, there are not a ton of them. And so you can get through all of the reports in a reasonable amount of time, uh, you know, if you go through it that way. So, um, so that, that's my uh, kind of thing on that. Um, anything else guys on that? All right. So here's like, uh, this is a very pretty specific question. Is it possible? for one officer to change the culture in the department or to change the culture of their crew? If so, how? So I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, in general, no, I don't, I don't think an officer is going to change the culture of the department. Uh, maybe a smaller department, you might have the ability to, if you were, you know, chief elected in a, in a smaller volunteer department, do I think I'm going to change the culture of the New York city fire department? No, I do not. Um, I certainly think an officer can change the culture of their crew, of their house, of their shift, depending on how you're structured. Um, I think there are many very good firehouses in the city that are very good because of the officers that they have and the senior men that they have. And I think there are a few lacking firehouses in the city because of the officers or the senior men that they have. So uh, I definitely think on a small, and I say small scale, but Changing the dynamic in the uh, firehouse is not small scale. If you can change the dynamic or the culture in your house, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a small feat at all. So what do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah. I think the same thing I kind of, I touched on it earlier was like, you know, with your expectations, I don't think well, one person can change the entire mentality of the job. Um, but you should be able to impact your crew. And it goes back to what I, I was kind of alluding to earlier was if you change, you know, you, your goal should be to change, try to change one, one, one person's mind or one person's perspective, you know, at a time, if you can find somebody that is looking that they're going to be moldable, mold them, you know, and then they translates to they, now you see two people are, are doing the same kind of stuff or three people or four people. And then it kind of becomes that that becomes the new normal if you just keep doing it the same way you've been doing it over and over and over uh you know and then that translates when when you have a guy who's off and you have somebody that comes in from another station and they're like well what's going on here you know like well this is this is just kind of how we operate here and this is this is what we do so you know maybe they bring that back to where they came from or or they don't you know and it, can you change everybody I, I i like to think you can but it's not realistic mm -hmm. George? I'm going to beg to differ a little. Um, I think if you, if you look back at what you guys are saying, it's kind of there. Um, it might not be one individual, right? But it, if you get, you know, something to start happening and then it slowly starts to build and build. And then if you have the opportunity, let's say it's operational and you have the opportunity to kind of show the abilities of what's going on or it's at the firehouse you know and now other people latch on to that and they bring it to their house because they're on overtime and you know they start talking about it and you get people oh that sucks it's stupid and 
sometimes it's insecurity, right? I mean, I can remember myself, you know, many a time saying, this is stupid, this is stupid. It's just because I was an idiot. Um, there's other reasons, right? Not everybody's an idiot, but that was me. Um, I think there's a possibility. Is it this grand, you know, you're going to walk out on a pedestal? No, no. And it shouldn't be that way. Um, I, th I think, I think there's a chance. Well, it's definitely uh, got to be a grassroots campaign. You're not yeah. just going to publish a book or a, <laughs> right. a publish a flyer and say, Hey, we're going to do this now and change the culture. Um, it definitely has to be, you know, from the ground up. Uh, but I just it's think your actions, it's, 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 it's yeah. let your actions do the work. And from there, it maybe it's it's a perspective on size, but like even take a take the volunteer of uh, Monroe or Trumbull. Like maybe you say, "Oh, I want to do this for the town of Trumbull." It's like, well, that's not going to work. Maybe you can start in your department, or maybe you can start in your house. You know, oh, I want to do this with the three companies in Monroe. It's like, yeah, okay, that's not going to you'll you'll that that's not going to happen. But you can start in your department and then see how it translates over. So. Mm -hmm. You know, I definitely, I see where you're going with that. So it, it does make sense. Um, what do I say? Uh, I just want to say for the record, I like looking at your face the whole time. Oh, great. All right, cool. All right. So I think we will finish up on uh, one last question, which is kind of a general, obviously we're not going to cover everything or even close to everything in an hour, 45, two hours tonight. So for those aspiring officers out there, career volunteer, whatever, what's their resources? What do you have any books that you would read? Uh, do you have any textbooks that are good, bad classes that you would take good, bad? What, what do you suggest for them to further their um, interest or uh, further their knowledge towards officer level training? Um, yeah, you know, they're, just take take the classes, take them, whether it's at, you know, the state academy classes, uh, third party vendors, stuff like that, you know, get get a broad range of opinions. You know, you don't want to stay pigeonholed in the people that you always agree with all the time, because then you are, you know, you're kind of only getting a one sided view of it. So I, I like to listen to people that I don't always agree with and listen to what they have to say. Maybe they change my mind. Maybe I'm looking at it one sided. Or maybe they're just wrong. Um, there you go. Yeah. So uh, that some real like leadership style books. Um, a lot of good stuff coming out of like military authors. Uh, pretty much anything in that that wheelhouse. There. Uh, they. There you go. Right there. That's a good one. Um, there's another. I can't remember the name of the book. I, I was going to pick it up. One of the guys at the firehouse is reading it and uh, thumbing through it. Is looks pretty good. Um, yeah, I think you know. The military puts out some pretty good leadership uh, books. Um, flash Fire Industries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was going to say was uh, not Flash Fire Industries, not that part. But um, yeah, I, I think there's two avenues that you have to take. And just like you you are when you're trying to get on the job and everyone uh, says, all right, I'm going to get Fire 1 and Fire 2 and that's going to get me hired. And it's like... <laughs> That's one avenue, and that will help you once you are hired. As we mentioned before, I think people that come from volunteer departments, as long you know, generally do pretty well with having the the uh, ability to don SCBA and stuff like that. But you have to also, you know, if you're going to get hired, you have to do CPAT, you got to do EMT, the stuff that's non-fire related. Um, I think in the leadership side, there's the two avenues. Also, you got to do, you should probably do fire officer one, fire officer two. You know those. The, the ones that are the certs, but you do have to open yourself up to other leadership books. And there are firefighter and non-firefighter leadership books. I think Extreme Ownership is one of the better books out there, um, leadership wise. Uh, and, a, and a lot of these books, for those that have long drives, you can get them on, on audio tape too, so you don't have to be reading them. Um, but I think there's a lot of that stuff that's really good. And you just have to always have an open mind. Um, you can't, you can't ever, as we said, you can't ever think that you know it all and you can stop learning. Uh, so I think that that's important. And, and again, start learning. If you're going to have to do a promotional exam, you guys probably have some idea what books are on them. So even if your test is not announced, um, you can start reading them now. And it's only going to make you a better firefighter. Uh, even if you read John Norman, you know, the ta his tactics book, even if that ends up not being a book on the exam, and it probably will be. 
even if it's not, you've still bettered yourself by reading reading one of his books, which are usually pretty good. So I think uh, I think there's a lot to be said with that stuff as well. So um, George, did you have any? I, I think Mike went. I didn't give you. Did you have any? I think you're dead on. Like I mean, I, you know, and nowadays with the social media, you know, take things for what it's worth, but a little from here, a little from there. And just put it together. I think it's a, it's a good thing. So a um, couple plugs. Uh, thank you guys for joining me this evening. <laughs> um, like that. You knew this was going to come up when you started showing my shit. So. I don't I don't care. Like, oh, you know, I know you don't. This was this was a life size poster at your promotion, if I remember correctly. So. Yeah, there are so many pictures out there, but I'm okay with it. <laughs> I know it's great. And so I'm a tiny I'm gonna... guy, so I don't care. I will, uh, I will let Mike and George uh, give any last moments that they have or any last comments, and then I will close it up. Um, in the meantime, I am putting a link in the chat for just an evaluation, as I always do, so that you guys can uh, you know, just evaluate the program so we can see if we're going to do it again or what we could do different. So, um, George, why don't you uh, close us out? Career volunteer, it's here, right? Love the job. You're going to have good days and bad days. Uh, try to better yourself. But I'm going to tell you this, and this is just my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. People might not like it. People might like it. If there's somebody trapped in a house, as an example, and the risk benefits, all that's there, all risk reward, remember, it's a human being, and there's nobody else that's going to save them or give them the chance except us. So you not only have the responsibility for your crew, but you have the responsibility of them. And the way I like to look at it is, and this is where I might get um, people against me, but, this, the, but the civilian population, when they're in dire need, their safety is first followed by us. Meaning I'm gonna push farther than I normally would. And it might not be the prettiest, but we gotta do what we gotta do. Does that mean that if the thing's 100% involved, you know, we're going to risk our guys? No, not at all. But sometimes we got to make that determination and, and push a little more. So take it for what it's worth. Appreciate everybody coming on and hanging out. Love the picture. It was awesome. Um, that's all I got. I'll send you uh, your checks in the mail. Just a nice steak would be nice. All right. Mike, what do you got? Uh, no, that's it. I mean, you know, be, be coachable, be authentic, uh, be, be yourself. Don't try to be someone that you're not constantly, constantly learning, constantly taking classes, uh, you know, going on things like this. This was, this was great. This is a good opportunity uh, for, for me also. This is like my first kind of speaking gig here. So, uh, you know, push, get outside your comfort zone, do things that you don't think you can do because you can do them. Uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, I, I take classes just as much and I haven't in the last couple of years with studying and COVID and everything, but I take classes just as much to network with other firefighters as it is to actually learn from whoever's the quote unquote instructor. And I know that that's something that's always come out of our classes too, is that, you know, you'll always see some side talks going on, uh, guys that meet each other and, and end up swapping, you know, oh guys, how do you do this? How do you do that? And I mean, that's what it's all about. Um, the other thing is, is teach. Uh, if you have a topic that you're, you know, in your firehouse that you're passionate about, teach, learn it, become the expert on it. Do you think I grew up learning about fire behavior? I, I did not. I, I, it's something that I've become somewhat of an expert on in the last few years. And, and even still I'm learning every day. So, you know, learn what you want, teach it. And that's what will make you better at it. Uh, I find myself more comfortable using the cam, more comfortable doing a search with a camera, the more I teach it. So I think, you know, the more you, you stay involved, the better off you're going to be. Um, and again, taking classes through all aspects, all companies, all topics, I think is a great uh, option as well. So um, again, I will throw up the programs that we have just so you guys, if you want, can mark them down. But uh, the next one will be in a couple of weeks, January 25th, meters in the fire service. I can pretty much guarantee that that will not be a two hour class because I'm sure I'll lose a lot more of you in two hours than that. 
And just remember, uh, we're, we're getting into training season before you know it. So we've got the live fire. Uh, we've got the trailer forcible entry roof vent. So please keep that in mind. Go to our website for South Windsor Rescue Weekend. And, uh, you know, please fill out the feedback that you can't uh, so that we can get your feedback on the program. Fill out the survey. And uh, anything else, let me know. Thank you all for tuning in. Everyone stay safe and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.